first uh, welcome to all the attendees and thank you for your patience uh, just to uh, maybe a couple of minutes late this morning and uh, good afternoon good evening because we have uh, people from different geographies uh, joining us today and uh, i want to thank you all and my name is arun gandhi and i have a distinct honor and privilege to host this panel this uh, this morning i work as a vp of marketing uh, at one touch without further ado i would like to introduce our panelists this morning and uh, so my first uh, panelist is going to be helen and i'm going to spotlight her so just to introduce helen um, helen works as a managing director for in the no limited i short as itk she also works in a global health data science company as a senior director of global <laughs> information governance Helen started her career in the NHS and uh, and lead and led number of uh, health intelligence teams across NHS using complex sensitive data to develop uh, innovative analysis to improve population health across public health research and commissioning in her successful career she has worked with many healthcare organizations understanding the challenges developing plans and solutions influencing policy and working with regulators She's also the founder of ITK, a consulting and training company which helps companies maximize the use of their data assets while balancing compliance, legal, and ethics. So, welcome, uh, uh, Helen. Thanks very much, Helen. The next uh, panelist I have is uh, Brent Walker. I'm going to bring him on on as well. Okay, so uh, Brent is an informatics professional and a chief data officer at ITK, with over thirty years' experience working in the English NHS, in an, in a number of senior roles, including the CIO of a large English teaching hospital. Brent has a very strong background and expertise in data governance, data management, project and program management. He's also a strong advocate for the effective analysis. of high utility healthcare data to improve the quality and efficiency of of healthcare delivery and healthcare outcomes welcome brand last but never the least is our ceo and founder i'm going to add him as well hi there uh I want, okay i want to introduce zack Zach Rubinstein is a founder and ceo at one touch uh, as a 13 year veteran of the security industry an organizational psychologist by training zack is a seasoned entrepreneur in the field of cybersecurity and privacy now bringing his third product to market as a co-founder vp of sales and business development at, uh, of uh, sequoia back in denny together with a talented team of individuals zack spearheaded entry into global markets of in denny security solutions bringing instant value to to its world uh, wide uh, customer base and zack holds a bachelor of science in psychology and masters in organization organization psychology and an mba so welcome uh, all the distinct panelists uh, this morning my first question i mean i have uh, tons of questions and we have a uh, pretty limited time so i'm going to be rapid fire but i'm looking forward to having a very uh, um, interesting discussion so i want to start with uh, helen i want to talk about the privacy compliance for healthcare So Helen the question to you is why do healthcare organizations need privacy compliance programs Um well privacy compliance programs are really important as they regulate the appropriate use of data and especially for health you know patients need to have trust when they're sharing their data because it's sensitive and they need to know that the data is only being used when it needs to be used and by who who needs to use it Um also patients need to be assured assured when data is used for analysis that it's only used as they may expect from things like public notices um and that they won't be inappropriately identified by any of that type of analysis so we've got like lots of privacy laws and regulations which um like regulate this space and they all vary slightly across different countries and jurisdictions but largely um the regulations promote the appropriate use of data and and um, they all um try to reduce the risk of identification from that data that's interesting and so brenda i'm going to turn it over to you now uh, so can can you please help me assess the the risks and the uh, benefits of the use of sensitive data 
uh, spe uh, specifically under the regulate regulatory requirements. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, as Helen said, um, healthcare data is probably one of the most sensitive and most confidential sets of data in the world. And I guess the big risk that any healthcare organisation faces is inappropriate identification of healthcare data in the wrong context and for the wrong purpose. And you know, if that happens, you can suffer all sorts of really bad consequences as a healthcare organisation. So obviously working under a regulatory regime, you run the risk of a regulatory intervention. Um, and obviously that could involve, you know, reputational damage or penalty fines, which can be literally millions of dollars, you know, really quite, quite bad, the cost of recovering data that's lost, etc. You know, and, and probably the biggest issue is, is the loss of trust and the massive reputational damage that you can have. That can really impact on your ability to, to gather data to to get patient trust to share their data to get access to data for secondary purposes for analysis so you know really significant consequences and the flip side of that obviously is the benefit so if you get privacy right and you manage the data properly you can have access to data you have a good reputation you can share data you've got data access for you know for innovation and improvement and you've got money to, to spend on service improvement rather than paying regulatory fines so yeah big risk big consequences but big benefits if you get it right so Helen, I'm going to turn it back to you. So what is the best way forward to sort of create an environment within which the benefits of uh, safe data use can be realized? I think the best way is to consider a, a framework of governance um, which, ensure, which ensures that data is appropriately controlled, you know, which operationalizes privacy and data regulation. Um, and it simplifies who can take what actions with what data and when. So, you know, putting that into practice, it's things like defining what your data purposes are, who can access that data, classifying your data, you know, um, ensuring you've got your master data management strategies set up and, you know, you've got your guidance in place. Um, and to be honest, there's, there's, there's a whole market now of... Um, organizations which have got lots of data governance tools which help people manage their efficient access to data whilst evidence in their compliant use so it's a really interesting space great thank you Zach, anything you would like to add uh, on this? Uh, anything, your thoughts, please? Actually, quite a bit, and I think you're going to need to shut me up at some point, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about two vectors here, uh, trust and also um, health, um, health companies, as it were. So, in England, you've got a division between private health and public health, right? So private health companies would be Bupa uh, and public health would be NHS trusts. Um, so, so I suppose my first, my first question or thoughts would be what the distinction is between, you know, private and public health. So obviously, I imagine there's less financial consequences for an NHS trust um, to, to have a data leak than, say, a Bupa, for example. Or is that incorrect? Like, would they suffer consequences and defunding. Um, the, second, the, second, the second question is, you know, when we talk about trust, and perhaps this is maybe an even more interesting uh, question. So, so people won't want to give their data. So if you give it to a, a, if you don't want to give your data to a public trust, then there's, there's stuff that you can't do, research, et cetera. I'm wondering if there's a differentiation as well, again, with the private type companies that can do all sorts of analytics on those data, to say, reduce the cost of providing help and therefore increase uh, profit margin. So just, just a couple of questions around that that I thought you know, would be great to open up. I think that if you're a, a public organization or a private organization, you still have to say how you use your data and mm. you know, that needs to be done in a wholly and above board manner. Um, I don't think anyone can use somebody's data if they haven't expressed why they're gonna use it and how they're gonna use it appropriately. So I'm not sure it makes too much difference. Absolutely. They're all bound by the same laws and regulations, aren't they? Whether you're a public or a private sector organisation or, a, you know, an acute provider or a public health provider, you still got to follow the rules and you have to use data appropriately and legally. I, I suppose maybe ask that's a brand degradation, right? So, so breach leads to brand degradation, right? Is it, is it as an acute issue for, say, an NHS trust as it is, say, for a private provider like Rubu? Because... You know, the CEO of Boop is going to be worried about their bottom line, right? Um, and, and that's going to have, you know, severe financial consequences. I, I understand the, the, the regulatory side of governance. I'm just wondering if there's financial implications, direct financial implications, as severe, say, for a, a private company. 
There are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the regulator in the UK, you know, the ICO, Information Commissioner's Office, will fine hospitals, has fined hospitals for breaching, you know, British data protection law. So absolutely, they're liable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Zach, for the questions, too. Um, second segment, rather, I want, I want to move to is more on the talking about the regulations across the world now. And... Uh, Brent, I'm going to turn it over to you here. So there are many different healthcare um, regulate, regulatory frameworks across the world. How do you make sense of all of them? You know, yeah. that, that's a big challenge. It, it, it is a big challenge. And in, in, in our course, we, we can see that right on because we've got this like world map um, and we've got all the links to all of the regulatory regimes across the planet. And I can't say I've read all of them um, from end to end, but but they all share, I think, a common theme, which is to making sure that data is used appropriately and you protect patients from that risk we've talked about, the risk of inappropriate identification. So in, in terms of making sense of them, I, I guess there, there are a couple of things I'd like to say. I mean, the, the first thing is that, you know, using a sort of generic data governance framework, and we've adapted and used a, a concept called the five safes, which asks you to look at data from five different perspectives. So you've got sort of safe projects, safe settings, safe people, safe data and safe, safe outputs, you know, and I'm not going to go into the details, we don't have time, but it's a really, really good lens to actually think about how data should be worked. And I think all of the different frameworks will have those very same things at the heart of them. Uh, and the second thing is, you know, this big thing about identification, it's all about assessing how identifiable data actually is. Um, you know, and obviously what we try to do is, you know, for non-direct care purposes to, to use de-identified or anonymized data and sometimes making the judgment about when data becomes anonymized or de-identified enough so you can legally process it is a, a difficult judgment. So we have a thing that we've developed uh, based on a UK concept called the spectrum of identifiability, which has fully identifiable personal, you know, confidential data at one end and fully anonymous at the other. And then as you apply de-identification controls to the data, the data becomes more and more de-identified, more and more anonymous. And eventually you'll come to a point where, you know, you've actually hit a threshold and that threshold is, you know, you're making a value judgment that at this point and beyond this point, the data is safe to process for analysis, for healthcare intervention, innovation, etc. So you can use tools like that to try and, you know, make sense of these huge and complicated documents. Right. But how do you make a judgment of this? So, well, yeah, well, you have to, well, yeah, you have to, you have to assess the risks, don't you? You've got to think about the compliance regime. You've got to think about the context of your processing. And at the end of the day, you need to have a, a tolerance, you know, a tolerance level for the risk. And, you know, and it, it is absolutely a value judgment, um, particularly in regimes like GDPR, where there aren't black and white data set definitions like there might be in HIPAA or other regimes. In GDPR, it's about reasonably unlikely to make data identifiable. And, you know, so it is a judgment call, I think. And you have to be able to demonstrate that you've done what you need to do to actually, you know, make the data unidentifiable. So you also mentioned uh, the causes of uh, uh, the identification risk. What are these? You can just run some light on there. Causes, yeah. Um, well, I think you can split it into two. Um, you've got malicious causes where there's, a, you know, an absolutely intentional, um, you know, action by uh, somebody or an agency to identify healthcare data, usually for some sort of gain or even to cause harm, malicious harm. Um, and then you've got the non-malicious causes as well, which are usually caused by poorly governed organizational processes, you know, poor data processing, things like that. So you've got those two different causes. Um, and we, we in ITK like to focus on maybe some of the more subtle things that can occur during data processing, such as poor pseudonymization, having too much data, you know, getting the right amount of data for the purpose, having too much is a bad thing, um, insufficient masking of identifiers, direct and indirect identifiers, you know, poorly controlling data linkage, which is a way of actually getting great value from data, but in doing so, you actually make the data potentially more identifiable. And then the, the, the biggest, I think, cause is uncontrolled data release or disclosure to third parties. You know, you've got to be really careful who you share your data with and how it's shared. I'll just piggyback on, uh, Brenda, what you just mentioned is, so what are the um, identification risk, uh, risk controls? How do they, what do they look like? 
if you can just um well yeah okay yeah um i mean obviously you've got you know cyber security standards like iso 27001 you know which talks about all of the things you'd expect to have in place to protect you know data at rest um secure networks two-factor authentication you know all those sorts of things good recovery if you do actually have a data breach all those sorts of things so you've got all of those typical cyber cyber security controls but you've also got i think controls that you need to apply during the processing of data. And I think there are two things we'd, we'd pull out there. One is getting the minimization right. I said, you know, don't make the data excessive. You do need to minimize data, um, but get that, get that right. And also think about the stages of the, the data and analysis lifecycle as well, and do it appropriately at each stage. Don't just do it all at the front and expect it's going to be fine downstream because it probably won't be. Uh, and the other big risk, I guess, is when you're processing, particularly if it's record level, patient level data, that you can get what's called singling out, where you get unique values when you analyze the data. And obviously, once you get unique values, you can link it to stuff, particularly publicly available data as well. So I think, you know, making sure that um, you have very good controls around data access, particularly highly granular data, patient level data, um, is really important to try and um, prevent the singling out risk. And also... Um, you know, watching how you generalize and mask identifiers, indirect and indirect identifiers. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. I'm going to, uh, so now that we've talked about the privacy, talked about the number of uh, regulatory compliances all across the world, the big question for the enterprises is, I don't know where my data is. I need to find my data, right? So uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Zach. Uh, is, uh, is, I mean, we do understand the healthcare organizations. They need... Uh, uh, data governance framework with mechanisms and best practices to protect the data, health, healthcare data privacy or privacy of the healthcare data. Uh, but the question is, what are some of these uh, challenges uh, this massive amount of data creates? Uh, in so, so I, um, you know, I want to piggyback off something that Brent said around uh, data minimization and, and tie everything into privacy security in governance or compliance, security in GRC. And actually, I think data minimization is uh, more of a common thing than people would realize. So clearly, Article 5 of the GTBR calls for data minimization. Um, it's a compliance requirement, and it's obvious why. Uh, and that's related to security, where the security um, challenge is, is reducing the attack surface, um, uh, the sensitive data attack surface. So you want to make sure that you don't have copies of people's data in different places, make sure that it's all confined to one place, etc. So, So that really speaks to the number one challenge is that over time you have data sprawl that, that people don't have any, any um, uh, control over. And then we can go over to the governance side. And for me, governance has two elements. Um, governance is related to regulatory governance and then just good data governance, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and the common theme that ties between that is another big challenge is that when you have, um, when you have um, copies of people's information or partial data of, of people in different places, um, it, it creates a challenge for the, the organization because they kind of want to understand their customer better. So, you know, from a governance perspective, you want to have good data governance. You want to make sure that if you ask something about Helen Brown, Helen Brown, you know, makes a request. We know all the places instinctively where there's information about how that's being used or, or processed for business purposes. But let's look at the other side of governance where we talk about quality of data and the way that that data can be used to uh, further business goals, for example, um, such as... Um, uh, uh, if you understand your customer data, how do I better market to those those people? So, so, so that's the other challenge. That people, uh, organizations have huge amounts of data about individuals um, that they really, really like to get a better handle of, so they can save money from duplicating marketing, have more focused marketing, understand which products are are, are more suitable, which healthcare products are, are more targeted if they want to do research how to target individuals. In fact, I know for a fact that if we had better handling on, on customer data and we were able to perform an analytics, you know, speaking to the CISO of Anthem in the US, he told me that would undoubtedly lower the cost of healthcare. So, so there's definite, there's definite you know, um, value, whether you're public or, or private, in terms of, of good data quality. And then there's the aspect of internal governance, right? You have internal uh, procedures that you want to make sure that are adhered to. And, and obviously, when you 
when you've got this data swirl, it just becomes very, very problematic. So, so if we think about you know challenges on three levels, security is reducing uh, sensitive data um, uh, surface attack area. From a privacy perspective, there's clear or compliance perspective, there's clear regulation that calls for minimization of data. And then from a, a governance perspective, it's, it's really about the quality of data and how you can use that data to achieve some of your goals. And, 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 and one of the reasons, by the way, that, that, that enterprises really want to have a better handle of where their sensitive data from an internal governance uh, perspective is a reduction of costs. So if you imagine, you know, that there was, you know, you, you've got huge amounts of extra data that you need to protect huge amounts of extra data that you need to store, whether it's in the cloud or on premise, you know, that, that takes, you know, resources in many different ways, the people to manage that data, et cetera. So you're seeing more and more um, internal government governance requirements to understand where your data is as a way to reduce costs. So, so all of these things, you know, ultimately affect the bottom line, but in, in very different ways. And I think that's at the foremost of, of people's minds. Excellent. Thank you. This is very helpful, Zach. And I also know, Zach, that you talk to many of these uh, uh, C, uh, C, uh, CISOs or the CEOs on a pretty much daily basis. So given the cha opportunities and challenges they have today, what do, what do you recommend? How should these organizations go about uh, doing the data discovery and management? Well, the first thing is don't believe as, as technology is the sole answer to your challenges. Don't believe in people as a sole answer to your challenges. And don't believe in processes as a sole answer to your challenges. There needs to be a, uh, a, a, an adequate mix between the three uh, in order to make sure you get the answer. So if you have a technology that relies too heavily on people input, then you've got a problem because you're just gonna have the same mess, but with a technology that's nicer to use. If, you, if you're very heavily reliant on the technology, you don't have the right processes in place or, or the right people that, you know, technology can only go so far, um, so, so, so if you, you know you have a great technology, but you don't have the right people to implement that technology. So, for example, or it's not implemented the right way. So, for example, you'll see some first-generation. Um, I, I call them old because privacy is a pretty fast-evolving um, uh, area. But those technologies that came out in 2017 or 2018, which requires a, a heavy amount of human effort, where there's a big focus on on say privacy bias. So you'd understand that if you get a technology and you have a lawyer that needs to buy that technology, they're like, well, I don't know what to do with it. So, so you, you need a technology that's going to help you get a handle on your data. And the question is understanding the teams that are going to own that technology. Um, it's not going to be the privacy team. Is it going to be the um, operations team? Is it going to be the IT team? Is it going to be the security team? You know, how does that interplay with, with other parts of the organization? So it, it's very much about adopting a strategy that, that has the right interplay. You know, don't adopt a technology that's not going to use because it's too, it, it, it doesn't provide. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you have you brought you bought a privacy technology that helps you keep track of data, but usually privacy people don't own technology. Who owns technology? Security people or IT people. And the question is, what extra value can that technology bring that team? Uh, because if it doesn't bring them any value and they just need to answer a privacy problem, I would I would venture to guess, and I've seen that the level of um, uh, how should I say, um, you know, caring about the updating that technology would go down unless the specific team sees value within their areas, which is very, very different from a, a privacy. So, so again, it's, it's the, the challenges and, and the thing that really you need to bear in mind is, is the right, um, right, I would say, play, the right balance between people, process and technology. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Zach. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to move on uh, to the, the next segment, which I had in mind, is more on. We talked about uh, uh, you know the data and how can, how it can be found. Found, but the, the the other challenge is the the data protection is not just about the privacy piece. You know, it's more to it. So I'm going to uh, go back to Helen here. So okay. Helen, if, if protecting data is not just about privacy, what else you know you you think about and it, it is important. Oh, there's a few things um, here, Aaron, um, and some of them pick up on Zach's point as well. Um, so, you know, when you implement um, privacy controls, it can have an impact on the data that's used and it can, it, it can 
it can result in data not being fit for purpose. And you know, some of this is about the privacy people understanding what the data people do and the data people being aware of why the privacy people need to do stuff. Um, so it's really important then that the accuracy and the utility of the data um, is, is taken into account when privacy controls are put into place so that you don't lose the ability to be able to carry out the actual business need. And, you know, as organizations across the world move to be becoming more data driven, that's going to become a, a, a bigger and bigger challenge that needs to be overcome to ensure the key success of organizations to make the right decisions. Um, in addition to sort of like getting the tech right and making it work for your data, you also need to consider sort of like the ethical use of data, um, that it's only used for, you know, the, the appropriate purposes. And also over and above the privacy of data, you know, so like referring to sort of making sure we're not um, inadvertently identifying anybody, you need to ensure that, um, that um, data which is confidential within a business remains confidential um, and that you're meeting things like contractual um, regulations um, and, and, and contracts and so on that all of that data remains um, protected. So it is more than just privacy. Right. So you're saying that are these things not always considered? <laughs> Well, do you know, that's really interesting. So from my background, you know, obviously coming from a data person's perspective, um, you'd be surprised just how much more privacy is considered. Um, because if you look at if you look at the front page of the newspapers, you know, privacy breaches a, a regular front page news. Um, and also technology and guidance are very much more um, focused on making sure that you don't have a privacy breach. I think that sort of the accuracy and the utility of data is something that people are starting to become more aware of, but it's definitely less visible to people in the first instance. And only people that really understand their data get to really understand these things. But, you know, really there are things like, um, there's principles in, in regulations such as GDPR. So there's an accuracy principle which basically expects that whatever you produce with your analysis remains accurate. You know, you're not supposed to put controls on top of it that um, end up with the data not being accurate um, and useful. So there is a real balance here. Um, and and, and organisations, it is something that they need to be more aware of. And we've been developing a, a course um, to try and help people more, be more aware of this very subject. And uh, I'm going to go back to Helen. So uh, the question I have is, so what are the consequences to, to the business loss of uh, data utility and accuracy in that case? So, yeah, the, the, it basically... It results in um, analysis with bias within them. Um, so it can manifest as the reduced ability to produce required analysis or worse still that the analysis has got flaws in it. And people may only realize that there's flaws in analysis when they've tried to use the analysis and put a service in place or an innovation or transformation um, and it doesn't actually meet their expectations. Okay, so that's great. So the uh, so, so we understand there is a risk. I know so that's that's given now. So can you tell us uh, some more about uh, how this happens, and maybe you know if you can give some specific examples, that'll be helpful. Yeah, of course. Um, so so these these sorts of risks generally manifest where you get um, data that's collected about patients, and then that data is then de-identified to be used. Um, for analysis purposes and during those processes um, data can be anonymized or it can be linked and you know um, those sorts of things and the reality is um, not everybody understands how to anonymize data in a manner um, without it impacting the quality of what you're using that analysis for and especially where you've got large organizations where things like de-identification and linkage and anonymization happens in one department and people use the data in other departments or in other companies um, across the world even, you know, people don't always understand how their data has been processed and what's been done to it before they use it. And the consequences of that is if you've got things like poor quality 
um, data quality in, um, in, in some of your source data and then you then anonymize it and you can't see those trends in the data, then you end up um, with a real unawareness of how the things like the anonymization, the de-identification and the linkage may have actually impacted the data. And then you then start to make analysis and then decisions on that data, um, which, which all have an impact. So uh, I'm going to move on to the last, uh, in the interest of time, I'd love to continue asking questions. But uh, the last piece, I'm going to talk more on the, on the practical tips to ensure uh, data utility and accuracy, and how we can address that. So the, I'm going to move on to uh, Brent. The first question to you is, and given you what you've said and what you do, I'm guessing you're going to be uh, suggesting that uh, data users and users need to be involved when environments and processes are, are up. Absolutely, Aaron, yeah. And I'm really picking up on the point I think Zach made earlier as well. Yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, I can generalize, um, but, you know, you tend to have silos or camps in an organization, a healthcare organization, and, you know, some obvious differentiations would be, you know, the data governance people, the engineers who manage the data environments and put the data sets together, and the data scientists and analysts who actually use it for, you know, innovation and insight. And often, you know, if, if you don't get this right, those can operate in three completely separate silos. And so one of the, the big top tips that we recommend is that getting those three silos to, to come together and you know, share common concepts and language, you know, share training courses, making sure they all understand the, the environment and understand everybody else's point of view as well. So they can build data environments that are actually both private, you know, and protect patient privacy, but also give the maximum utility um, for the analysts to get the answers out that they need, you know, so get that collaboration and communication is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Great. Uh, so Brent, uh, just one more on, thought on that is uh, you mentioned earlier in, in, the, in your response that data minimization needs to be done at the right time, uh, state of data and uh, at the right, in the right time and state of the data analysis, mm -hmm. life cycle management. And so the question to you is, uh, Look, can you elaborate a little bit more on it, please? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. So, you know, so absolutely. Um, data, as Helen said, you know, has both, you know, a need to be accurate. Um, and, and I think things like GDPR say data must be adequate and necessary. So that doesn't mean using less data than is actually needed to answer the question you need to answer. So it is all about, you know, making sure that you do that minimization in a very nuanced way. And I think there are some key things to watch out for so one of the things to watch out for is when you're an analyst and you're trying to work out you know a data extract and a query to do you know to get an answer to a business question that you don't frame the business question too literally and pull in a data set that's very specific around that very tight definition of the business question you really need to understand the impact of other un possibly you know initially unrelated variables on on that data set and how they influence the result so you've got to watch out for that framing the questions too literally uh, and one thing we recommend is that people do exploratory analysis um, before they do a full data extract to, to, to do the actual final piece of analysis. Uh, another risk, I guess, is also generalizing at too high a level. So, you know, you take, uh, you know, for example, geographic data and you turn it into a higher geographic concept. But if you do that at too high a level, again, you can miss important trends and relationships in your output. So thinking carefully about that um, and a way maybe you can get around that as well is, is actually getting your engineers when they're building the environment to do lots of pre-processing and data flagging and getting the, the data scientists and the analysts around the table with the engineers to talk about how to flag the data to give them the insight they need without giving them the whole huge data set you know is a really good tool and technique to, to get around and, and avoid the risk of loss of utility. Great. So Helen, uh, so if there is one data utility and accuracy or loss risk, risk factor that you feel shouldn't be overlooked, what would that be? Oh, gosh, and <laughs> um, this is a tough one for me, but I think I'd have to, um, I think I'd have to say the challenges which arise when you link data, where the quality of identifiers for, for patients or citizens may not be perfect. Um, and I think that the, the consequence of this is that it, it results in data linkage happening for people with great quality data and data linkage not happening for those that don't have good quality data. And where data is then used for things like population health management purposes, 
um, and approaches are used to segment and risk stratify population cohorts, it means those that have linked go through to get whatever interventions and those that haven't don't. And the research that we've undertaken and is, is, is available um, via the internet as well from, from research at places like UCL suggests that um, it is your health inequality groups, your most deprived, poor um, ethnic group populations, which are least likely to link and most likely to have poor data quality of identifiers. So therefore that then promotes an, a continuation of health inequalities, which, you know, that's not what we're trying to achieve. Interesting. So anything, I mean, I'm pretty much done with my question in the interest of time, but anything anyone would like to add, uh, uh, Zach, uh, Brent, Helen? Well, well, 